Well, well, well. <clears throat> My dear, dear friend who's in heaven now, Dr. Tom Malone, always said, or many times I heard him say, and that <clears throat> gravelly voice that he had, he'd say, I, he said, I want to be brief tonight. I never have been, but I always want to. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I do not have a reputation for preaching long-windedly, but, uh, <clears throat> but sometimes I do get out of bounds just a little bit. But anyway, I'm delighted and thankful for the privilege that I've had to be here again today, and uh, just a joy to come and be with Dr. Ms. Bloom and just to spend time to see many of you that I've gotten to know over the years. And thank God for what you're doing in this wonderful place where you're located here. I, I enjoy coming to Ocala. There's, there's two, two places in Florida, uh, of which this is one, that uh, I have said to Betty any number of times, Garden Spot of Florida. And I really do, I think Ocala is, is that way. And there's a lot of good places here, but a couple of them especially that I like a lot. And I won't mention the other one because we're here. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I'm delighted. I want you to turn tonight to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And uh, want to uh, dig in here just a little bit and starting to read in verse 23. Psalm 37, verse 23. This passage here in the Bible, in God's precious word, tells us the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he, flaw, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He, that is, this good man, is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Now, when this passage talks about a good man, those of you that have been a Christian very long are going to remember that the Bible says in another place that uh, there's none good, no, not one. Now, as with all such things, when we appear to have a dilemma, there's, there's a sense for straightening it out. And uh, that would be the case here. When uh, the book of Romans talks about none good, no, not one, it's talking about unsaved people. Unsaved people. But in this case, the Lord God Almighty says that a good man exists on the planet. So how, how does he get there? Well, this passage tells us. But basically what we're looking at here is this is a man who's saved. He has cleaned up his life, straightened up his life, so much so that the Lord himself refers to him as a good man. So again, just getting things uh, straight and applying them where they need to be applied, and we get that figured out. Now, in regard to that, this chapter does what uh, Psalm 1 does in such classic style in that it tells us about those that are not on the good side and then those that are. You remember Psalm 1 tells us the, the blessing that comes when a man uh, walks with the Lord and doesn't take his counsel from the ungodly, etc. And then it lays out the t details of the ungodly. Well, let me just show you here before we look at the details of this text. Uh, there, there's a great contrast drawn here. And it is a contrast between good and evil. Or you might call it light and darkness, sweet and sour, however you want to lay it out. It's two distinctively different things. And so, uh, first of all, let's look at the world's way. Verses 1 and 2, chapter 37. This is the world's way. The Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they, talking about these folks on the worldly way, they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Drop down to verse 8. Bottom part of the verse says, Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. Verse 10. 
for yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Look at verse 18. The Lord knoweth, no, I'm sorry, I jumped, uh, uh, verse 12. The, the wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Verse 17, For the arms of the wicked shall be broken. Uh, verse uh, number 20, uh, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, into smoke shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Verse 32, The wicked watcheth the righteous, and seeketh to slay him. Verse 35, I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a green bay tree, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. And then verse 38, But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. Now all of that lays out the story. I mean, you see people today, they're living uh, like wild dogs, they're living out in the world doing every kind of an ungodly thing. And if you listen to them talk, man, they've got everything going their way. The world is just grand and they're happy as larks according to them. And, uh, and yet the Bible lays it out here very, very clearly. They, they are misrepresenting the facts. They are not getting it correct. They're not looking at things like they ought to be looked at. And the Lord says here, you know, go, go, ahead, and, go ahead and do what you decide you want to do, if you will. But he said, I'm telling you, the day is coming when all of that will come to an end. People are going to look and they're going to say, well, look at what all this guy's got. And one of these verses says, even his place shall not be found. Everything is going to be uh, just shut off, shut down, cut down, etc. So you and I ought to be encouraged. I mean, we are on the winning side, amen? amen. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, we get to look around and seeing all the trash and the garbage and the, and the uh, just devastatingly stupid things that are going on in our society. And uh, we look at that, and, and it can be depressing. It can be discouraging. But you and I have every reason to get up, stand up, put our shoulders back, and just keep marching, pressing on, doing what we're supposed to do. I mean, whatever is said, whether people like us or loathe us, whether they stand with us or against us, we have every reason to be excited, to be stirred up, and to just keep flying the flag right up at the top of the pole every day. Now, the other part of the story here, we looked at the world's way, but let's back up and walk through the chapter again. And here's what the Lord says about those who do this right. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Verse 11, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Verse 16, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Verse 18, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Verse 22, For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. Verse 27, Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. Uh, verse 29, 
Uh, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Verse 37, mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Verse 39, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. Now, frankly, that's the crowd that I want to be associated with. That's the crowd I want to be a member of. I want to run with that group of folks. And whenever we do that, there obviously are things that go with that, things that accrue to just being in that vein of thought as we live our life from day to day. Now, just like Psalm 1, the blessed man, the man who doesn't get the blessing, it's all laid out here very, very clearly. Now, we back up to the text that I read at the outset that talks about the good man, and it talks about who this man is and what he does. And we take a look at this good man, and the first thing that we spot is will be his ordered steps. His ordered steps. Where is he going? What's he doing? Well, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That means you can start in Genesis 1, and uh, you don't have to read very far to know that, uh, that uh, Darwin was, uh, well, I don't know, I'll try to think of something nice to say. He was uh, kind of an income poop, and, uh, you know, uh, not, not too bright in many ways, and came up with things. Oh, I think it was bright enough, actually, but uh, the fact of the matter is he was bent wrong and uh, was looking for some way to explain how we all got here, and so he invented something. And, uh, but we get dug in right to the Bible early on, and, uh, and no, nobody's going to take us down that trail. I like what uh, I heard Lester Roloff say a couple of times while he was still alive. Lester said, and of course, you know, his headquarters down there in South Texas, and he said, nobody would make an atheist out of him as long as they were growing watermelons in South Texas. <laughs> now, you've been down there, you know South Texas is sandy soil and it is dry. I mean, you talk about uh, the driest of the dry, and yet they plant the watermelon seed in that sandy soil and it grows some of the biggest, finest, juiciest melons. Well, where does all that juice come from? Uh, that melon is what, 90 some percent water? And uh, Lester said, nobody's going to make an atheist out of him as long as God's creating watermelons out of that sandy soil. Now listen, there are so many things on this planet we, we could spend days just talking about all of the things that are just so absolutely obvious about that. And so what happens here? Well, it's starting in Genesis, and, and we work through all of the Bible, and we're going to find all kinds of things that are going to say to us, hey, get with the program. Listen to what the Lord has to say. Let Him tell you what to do. Uh, Brother Lloyd's mentioned this morning that Betty and I have been, Betty and I have been married um, a long time. Uh, <laughs> I tease her sometimes, and I'll say, uh, you know, girl, we've been married 800 years. <laughs> it hasn't been quite 800, only 798. But anyway, uh, no, we, we've got 62 done, and, and uh, Lord being our helper later this year, we'll have our 63rd anniversary. And uh, I jokingly tell people I was only three when she married me, but nobody believes that. <clears throat> but, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, here we were, two kids in high school. Met her first day of 10th grade. And by the time we got to 11th grade, we were friends and paying attention to one another. By the time we got to 12th grade, we were sweethearts. And by the time we graduated, I was, I was ready to say, you know, uh, you know you're sticking with me. And uh, she was looking at me and saying, do you want me to? And, uh, and we made an agreement together. And a little while later, we went and said our I do's. And so here we are all these years later, and listen, happy about it. Amen. Happy about it. Now, you say, how did that all come about? Well, listen, now, you all have met her, and you know she's a very sweet lady. She's a bright lady. She's got, I mean, literally, literally, I mean, she is all of that. But you say, well, you all, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm not sure we would have made it 
except for the orders that we got from the book. We learned some things from the book about how to make marriage happen, how to live together in harmony, how to treat one another right, how to be good to one another, all those kinds of things. And listen, I'm looking at people all over this building. Some of you have been married a long time as well. And you don't, you don't get longevity and happiness after the longevity. You, you don't get that. You don't get there just by being selfish and by running with the world and doing all kinds of garbage things. You don't get there doing that. But if you listen to the Lord, if you listen to the Lord, then you can, as he said, got old. He said, I was young, but I got old. Well, you get some miles on you and still be happy about being married to each other. Amen. Now, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us found out, you know, uh, you, you know you're, you're perfectly happy and then you have children. <laughs> now, hey, don't misunderstand me. We have a daughter and we have a son. We love them dearly and, and they've turned out well and we're happy and excited about that. And, uh, and, and so, but sometimes, even though you're, you know, everything's clicking for you in your marriage, but these children come along and they put pressure on the equation. And all at once, there's some more things we have to learn. So, and Dr. Bloom knows my son, who's he and I've been working together. He's been my partner in the ministry for 32 years, and uh, and we've worked together, get along together, on the same page together. We never never have any battles over philosophy or what we're into. We're just working together, and and enjoying it as we go. And you say, how how do you get there? Well, once again, we found out there are some things in God's book that gives us orders about how to go about raising kids. Now, <laughs> Betty would tell you, and I will tell you, we, we never one moment imagined that we were the perfect parents because we are human beings, and we, if, if we had it to do over, we'd improve on some things. But I'll tell you this, we again and again and again listened to what we found in the book and tried to make that happen at our house. Now, again, we're not perfect at any of this, but the deal was we're not doing this because daddy's the pastor. We're not doing this because daddy's a preacher. We're not doing, no, none of that. We're doing this because God is God. We're Christians. We're serving the Lord. We want our home to be the kind of a home the Bible says that a Christian ought to have. And I'm telling you, when you order it up like that, uh, there's just good things in the offering. There's good things coming. Uh, you know, it's true with business. I know some of you have got a business that you started, you're running it's your livelihood, you're thanking the Lord for what He's given you and all of that. And I'm just telling you, plug in Bible principles in your business. Plug it in, do it the Lord's way, be honest, treat people right, all those kinds of things. And uh, it, it's, just, it's just the way to go. When you get a reputation as a business person, you get a reputation that your word's good, that you will do what you say. Uh, the general rule of thumb is, People will spread the word and they'll gravitate to you and you'll have more business than you can handle. And I've seen many, many a guy do it that way. And so I'm just simply saying, the good man, this guy, he got saved. He's walking with the Lord. And what does he do? He lets his steps be ordered of the Lord. Now, second thing that we notice in the text is, verse 23 says, that he, that is the good man, delighteth in his way, delighteth in God's way. So not only are we looking here at his, at his ordered steps, but we're looking at what I'm going to call his borrowed delights. You know, it's one thing for your children to do what you tell them, but the day comes that they start delighting to do what you tell them, that's a new day. And sometimes we start following the Lord. Well, yeah, this is what God said to do, and we'll do it. But whenever, and, and at that stage in the game, Whatever delights we have, we may have to borrow from Him and just say, well, Lord, you said you would, and we're waiting to see if you will. And we're borrowing delight from Him. But there will come a day, if you'll do this and do it and do it and do it, there will come a day when you will say, oh my, it is good, it is right, it is blessed, it is sweet. We like what we've done in letting the Lord order up our life. And whenever we delight in His things, we are on a good page. Look at verse 24 that talks about what I'm going to call his promise rebound. The Bible says this good man may fall, but he shall not be utterly cast down. 
What does that mean? It means he's going to get up. He may, he may, I mean, the stock market may have crashed on him, but he's going to get up. Uh, I mean, he may have had uh, some kind of a thing happen. His house burned down, but he's going to get up. I mean, on and on and on, all the t- kinds of things that happen. I had a communication this afternoon with a dear friend who just a few months ago, his grown daughter was murdered. And, uh, but he called to tell me that even now, a few months beyond that, that several people that she was acquainted with have gotten saved and are now in church with them even though she's gone. And they were not in church at all while she was living. Now, you know what, what's happening with them. Now, I'll be with him in a couple of weeks in meetings. I've been preaching for him for about 20-some years as well. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I mean, I've been brokenhearted with them. But at the same time, you know, what I see, they've, they've had a sorrow that nobody should ever have to endure. But he's getting up. He's getting up off of the, I mean, well, they've been knocked down. They've had their props knocked out from under them. But I can see him. He's, he's getting up. He's getting his feet under him again. The church in Atlanta that I've <clears throat> been preaching in more than 30 years. And families connected with that church. Last year, there were three families in that church that had a young adult murdered in that one church. And it's not a large church. And I mean, I, and I mean nobody, nobody being an outlaw, nobody being off in dirt and trash that they should be in. I'm talking about young people that were good young people and, and, and the, uh, three, three different families in that church were touched by murder. Now you say, what, what's going on with them? I was just there a few weeks ago and those families, they're, they're up, they're singing in the choir. <laughs> you know, they're running their bus routes. They're, they're serving the Lord. They're, they, they're up. They, I mean, did it knock them down? Yes. But they got up. They got up. They got up. And the Bible says, this good man. You say, well, man, you have something like that happen. How? Point number one, the ordered steps. The ordered steps. And then taken to the light in that. And then uh, you get knocked down, but you rebound. You get up. The Bible says, a just man falleth seven times but riseth up again. Amen. You can keep knocking him down, knocking him down, knocking him down, but this guy is going to keep getting up. Not only that, but look here. Verse 24 also talks about this good man's supernatural assistance. When it says, For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You know, <laughs> I look around here. I mean, here's, here's a bottle of water I started on this morning. It's kind of heavy, 17 ounces of it. But you know, I can lift, I think I can lift two of those. I mean, the Lord did give me a little strength, so I, I can lift a few little things like that. And we got this pulpit here. I, I don't know, I might be able to push it over, but I doubt that I could pick it up and put it on my back. Probably couldn't, probably couldn't carry it. There are limits that I have. And there are limits that you have. But there is one who's the great creator for whom there are no limits. He is illimitable. And whenever the loads get heavy, greater than what I can lift, greater than what you can lift, guess what? Oh, this is where God steps in in supernatural fashion and assists us so that we will rebound, so that we will maintain our delight. And that's why you get to verse 25 and we see the glowing testimony of the psalmist. He said, I've been young. And now I'm old. He's just taking note of the fact that, uh, you know, he's lived a lot of years. And he said, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. I've not seen the righteous forsaken. What's he talking about? His glowing testimony. Just saying, man, because we've walked with the Lord, we've let him order our steps. He has been right there with us. He never left us, never forsook us, always there with us. You may be out somewhere in the dark of the night. The Spirit of God lives in you and His presence is there with you every step. Every step. Then you look at verse 26. And it says that this good man is ever merciful and lendeth. 
What are we talking about here? We're talking about his ongoing compassion. I mean, this guy has a heart, and he's got a heart for other people. He's got people around him. They mess up in some way. He shows mercy to them. They may have a need. He may, he may lend something to them. He may help to bail them out, get them out if he's able to do that. And this passage just talks about the compassion that this good man will have. And then the, uh, the bottom part of verse 26 says, And his seed is blessed. Talking about his long-term influence. You know, I have wanted to pass some things along to my children, to my grandchildren. And Betty and I have a little two-and-a-half-year-old great-grand now, just one. And, uh, and we want to pass along some things to them. And with the grandchildren already, and with our children and our grandchildren, we, we've, seen, we've seen good uh, success with that. We've seen that happen already and thankful for it, glad for it. And I'm just telling you, you back up to point number one, point number two, point number three. You get knocked down, get up. Somebody's watching. Those little grands, they're watching. They see how you behave, or if you misbehave, they see that. If, if, you, if you don't walk the walk and talk the talk, they'll see that. And if you do as you ought to do, listen, they're watching and your influence, sometimes your influence is not when you got the microphone, your influence sometimes is when you're dragging your tracks and you've been knocked down and you've been hurt and they see how you handle it and how you let the Lord be that supernatural assistance that you need. And that's where the influence begins to build. Now, I look at this passage that talks about a good man. And I'll ask you, you want to be one? But here's, here's where it is. It all starts with a choice. We all have choices. You know, we can, we can do it the Lord's way. Or if we choose to go the world's way that's laid out here, yeah, we could do that. So it does all start with a choice. Somewhere along the way, everybody that gets this working in their life like the Lord lays it out, every last one of us who've ever had any of that, it's because a choice was made. We're going to go that way. And it requires not only a choice, but it will require a commitment that is so deep that when the sun doesn't shine, you're still right there. When heaven is comes, you don't quit. Dr. Dr. Bloom's song, don't quit, don't quit. You know, I mean, somebody, somebody slaps you down, don't quit. Somebody treats you ugly, don't quit. Somebody, uh, you know, cheats you in some way, don't quit. Country goes sour, don't quit. It requires commitment for the light of the day and for the dark of the night. For the valley and for the mountain, it requires a commitment. And all of that can happen, but it all will start at a point of conversion where we turn to Christ and receive Him as Savior and allow Him to come into us and begin to be there for us. It all starts on that day when we look at ourselves, a lost sinner, helpless, in need of a Savior, and we say, I'm willing to trust Him. He died on the cross. He arose from the grave. He did it for me. And I'm going to claim it and by faith receive it. Amen. And that is the point of conversion. When He regenerates us and moves in and takes up residence in us. All of that I can have, you can have, simply because we decide to put our trust in the crucified and risen Christ. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and He delights in His way. You know, there's another verse here in this chapter I read a little while ago, and I, I love this verse. It says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That means if I, if I get to thinking right, if I get on page with the Lord, He'll let me do some things that I like, because my likes are going to be in line with His, and He'll, he'll bless that. I love that. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. You know, we sing that little song, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. 
Well, believe me, dear friends, it is. It is. Stand up with me and we'll pray together.